a police academy spends 60 hours on firearms training, shooting, and only eight hours of de-escalation. Mm. And so they're taught to command and control. Mm -hmm. The mindset that they're that drilled into them is when you walk into a space, you're the one in charge. People need to listen to you. You know, and if somebody pushes back, you you know, the way that they prove themselves is they have to fight or arrest somebody or right. write, you know, write tickets, make arrests. So it's all like none of that is about serving the community and de-escalating yeah. and taking care of people. Yo, hey, when we go slap today. Yo, hey, when we go slap today. Yo, 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 yo! What Welcome up, back! What up? Slap the Power Season 2. Deuce, deuce. Deuce, deuce. I am your host, Rick Barrio Dill. My name is Maya Sykes. Yes, and I am so glad to be back in the studio. It's been a long, long summer. We talked about this on the on the last episode, but uh, so many things have happened and so many things to talk about and to get into. But on the show today, uh, we're definitely, definitely going to be uh, hearing from Maya Sykes, who's been, you've been reporting out from the field on the strike. I have. Uh, yeah. uh, shout out to Kenton Chen and the Unofficial Singers Committee um, on Facebook. Facebook. So we as singers have been trying to make sure that we make a presence in the strike. And on Tuesdays, we've been doing our best to meet up. Uh, sometimes I can't always go on Tuesdays because I teach, but I have been there a few Tuesdays and I try to go at least one day a week to some portion of the strike. But um, shout out to all my singer friends who have rallied and done some really incredible things. They had a kids uh, version of singers uh, come out uh, two Tuesdays ago. They had a really big uh, presence for the uh, National Strike Day hey. uh, that they did, you know, across um, unions. And um, our friend Fletcher, who um, sat down with um, KTLA to talk about why singers kind of had a dog in this SAG after fight, sure. has been coming up with really cool jingles that we sing. So his last one was uh, It's the Tune of Eye of the Tiger, but it's Lie of the Iger because we've been, because oh. uh, <laughs> we've been <laughs> rallying. Lie of the uh, yes. Iger. Uh -huh. That's great. So, um, the morale is still good because the the belief that is still carrying on is that this is kind of a now or never thing and that yeah. we have one chance to get this right because it's been wrong for so long. Um, and in doing so, we've really had to change the attitudes of what people think you get if yeah. you are in the entertainment business. Yeah. So I think that it's allowed for a transparency that people see why we're still fighting. Nobody wants to be doing this, but sure. we've really been impressed upon that these studios do not want to negotiate at all. Mm. And one by one, industries are falling because yeah. they don't want to negotiate. So the latest dog in the fight is the voiceover and video gaming industry. That's coming down. And, and, that's, a, and that's a big <clears throat> one. You know, huge. I'm surprised that live entertainment didn't go, but I guess they were able to make a last minute uh, contract negotiation. But mm. and, at the end of the day, this is about making livable wages for people yeah. and not treating them like they are underclass because they're asking for livable wages. And this is something that affects each and every one of us, unless you're in the 1%. And if you're in the 1%, congratulations, but you still <laughs> don't have the right to treat people like slaves and demand that they give you things just because you want them and you want to keep all the profit share. You do not have the right to do that. Yeah, it's we'll wonderful to see that people have decided enough is enough. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And obviously everything is uh, affected in in our town in Los Angeles by uh, by these strikes. And so we're going to be doing an episode specifically devoted that, towards that a little bit later in the season. And uh, I also want to say on Tuesdays, let a brother know. I'm going to, I'll come down with you. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, we're, let a brother know. And sure. shoot, we could do a, we could do a, you know, shout out and have, if you're in the Hollywood area, we'll, we'll try and figure out when we're going to go and make a, make a, make, you know, make a thing out we of it. We can do slap the power on the street. Oh shit. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, also on the show today, uh, we're going to be doing, 
doing a repeat uh, a little bit later of a new segment that we've got that's called Tour Horror Stories. Stories. <laughs> <laughs> that's we right. have to do that every single time that it's, we say tour because it just isn't effective without the ha 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 ha. It really does. Uh, it's, it's, I'm Count Chocula. It's a, yeah, All I, I can mean, think of is when I do that is Count Chocula. I'm trying to give you like Vincent Price hey, yeah. meets the Count from Sesame Street. Like that's what, that's what I'm giving it. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also on the show uh, a little bit later, we had the pleasure of uh, interviewing in studio um, the, this this brilliant, brilliant man, uh, Matthew Solomon. He is a documentary filmmaker and an activist and a musician. A musician. And he just did a film uh, all on an iPhone um, and shot it. And it's actually it's winning awards all over the place. He's been doing screenings all over town. And now he's doing screenings all over the country. But uh, the film is called Reimagining Safety. Sorry, Reimagining Safety. And um, it's it's really an examination of things in a post-George Floyd world. And so uh, stick around and listen to that. The interview was really great. I, I learned a ton. I know we had a, we had a blast, uh, you know, just actually opening this issue up and feeling like, okay, there are ways that we can sort of help and rethink about this. So that was really helpful. And there helpful. Are, are ways to imagine uh, a world in which the police force has a different purpose. And there is definitely going to be the unpopular opinion that the word policing is synonymous with militarization. Mm. So there's the impetus to try to change the word policing just in general. Sure. But I think that overall, we can agree that we need to give better support to our communities and we need to give better support to our police officers because there's the missing link. Yeah. So I really think that this film educates you on how that's even possible yeah yeah so reimagining safety com, i think is the website mm -hmm. but we we uh we touch on we'll put it in the show notes and the interview is really really great and um you know but first i actually it's this issue reimagining safety is sort of uh and we get into this in the interview a little bit but for me uh you know i've always been i i associate I associate with the black culture. I just, I, I always have, um, I've been, you know, the only white guy in an all black band of most of my life. Uh, the music I listen to, it's all my heroes have always been black. And it wasn't, it kind of almost wasn't until I think there, the, the us being trapped inside uh, from the pandemic and having to look at uh, having, and then George Floyd and then having to look at, a president d d holding a fucking Bible upside down in front of a burning church uh, to where I was like, that was the impetus for creating slap for me because I kind of felt like, okay, we're, we're not going to be able to tweet our way out of these uh, events that keep on happening. And I wanted to be able to put together a voice or a, a, at least a, a vehicle and a spaceship to be able to talk about these things and to be able to try and feel like we have a little bit more agency um, by, by, you know, having a larger sort of immediacy towards the communication and things. Whereas, you know, you write a song and you write it about something like this, like George Floyd. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. And the power of music is amazing, but it can take a long time for that to sort of find its way back to you, you know, in the circle of trying to help people and uh, really trying to help people, trying to enlighten people and trying to figure out where the Venn diagram is that, that especially, especially in policing and in areas of, uh, of trying to love one another and trying to protect and serve. And so that, you know, that was the reason why I created slap. I was because of in a post George Floyd world, I just feel like things are, things are different. And so we do have opportunities to, to so let's get the facts together and let's figure out, okay, well, if, you know, if there is this budget, what, how can we, you know, help advocate for these things, whether they be legislatively or how can we advocate for, for, for better things to where I remember being a kid when I was a kid and the cops would come by. It was actually a good thing, right? You, at a certain point, uh, until I, until I was living in the, you know, in the black neighborhood, it was a different story, but, uh, but I, when the cop would come by, it'd be a good thing, right? You were like, oh, okay, cool. Somebody's looking out for you. Somebody's looking out for you. And then I remember being the only white guy living in this, 
project in the project area. I got shot at a couple of times, a couple of bullet holes in the back of my car and shit. And then I was pulled over every time I was there for being white in an all-black neighborhood because they were like, well, you're just here buying drugs. That's the only reason you're here. Or supplying the drugs. Or supplying the drugs. Hey, you know, you know, it was a now, good see, week. For me, um, this film had a different... Uh, perspective I, maybe I bring a different perspective to of this course, film yeah. because I grew up with police <clears throat> violence my entire life sure. that's what I know that's what I've seen my and for the people life. that don't know to where you were born here I, I was born here uh, I was born in Long Beach I've lived in South Central Watts Hancock Park uh, Venice uh, and Silver Lake so I've lived all over Los Angeles and when we lived in South Central and when we lived in Watts police violence towards people of color was the norm. I would see people who were rounded up because they were wearing what was classified as gang gear. But at that time, it was if they were wearing Nike Cortez shoes or Raiders fitted hats, they were they immediately assumed to be gangbangers. So I remember um, many incidences that this the police brutality towards black men specifically was so targeted and it became the norm. We all would just assume the position because this became the yeah. norm. And you would teach your children, this is what you do if the police pull you over because it was survival, right? Yeah. So I always tell this story. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom got a better job and we were able to move. Uh, at the time, we were living near USC. And my mom, uh, when she got promoted, was able to move us to the Hancock Park area. And again, as a child, I'm 11 at this point. All I knew was the police rounding you up and whatever. Yeah. At the time, I was learning fractions in school. So my mother would do this thing where we would cook and she would change the if Johnny uh, cooks one eighth of a crack yes, rock, <laughs> no, but more like, you know, we're going to make this recipe for eight instead of four right, or right, for right. two yeah. instead of, you know, whatever. Yeah. And she would make me do all the math. You know, right? Sure, sure. So I remember this very, very specifically because we moved just before Thanksgiving. And uh, right around, just before Christmas time, my mother had bought all these cookie tins. Uh. And she said, we're going to make brownies and cookies. And I was like, oh, yay, that's fun. And she said, okay, we're going to, you know, make this recipe. It says it um, uh, makes 20 cookies, but we need to make 100 cookies. So let's do the math. And I remember we did all the math or whatever. And we... Bought, you know, made the brownies and the cookies. And then we went to the fire department and the police department. And I remember this so specifically because I didn't clock what my mother was doing until I was in my 20s. My mother went around going, hi, we're new to the area. This is my daughter, Maya. And we made you these cookies and, and whatever um, because, you know, she's learning about fractions yeah. and we're learning about the different parts of the police department and da 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 da. My mother was making sure these people didn't see me as a black kid mm. but that they saw me as a kid mm. my mother was protecting me yeah. and I didn't that's even beautiful. realize that that's what she was doing yeah she yeah. was getting them and we did this every year yeah by the time you know because everybody in the neighborhood we were one of like nine black families they knew who I was mm. and they didn't think I was an intruder yeah they right. saw me as a child not as a black child who was there to start trouble and my mother had to cement that into these people's minds annually and I had no idea that that's what she was doing that's great and I mean that's that's the word defund the police uh, it just it's it's not a good faith argument and so that's why I'm glad we get into that in the interview a little bit later it, it is it's I do think there is a an association I love that that story because I do think people it's a community thing and people need to sort of be connected to their community more and that means the 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 people like the, the police and the firemen that are working there there should be a, a bond there because we're relying on them for when you know emergency strike and stuff like that and they're relying on us uh, for you know keeping the community uh, you know running and and for uh, you know, building prosperous communities and stuff. And because so. at the time, especially when I was a kid, up until I was a teenager, actually, this was uh, quite a traumatic event. Uh, one of my uh, classmates, her father was shot and killed by the police when he reported a robbery at mm. his own home. 
and they mistook him for the robber. And he was an aeronautics engineer for Boeing. Wow. He had three children that he sent to Ivy League schools, and they shot this man. Wow. on his porch because he called to ask the police to help him. Yeah. And that is an attitude that we have to change. If we're going to change anything about police brutality, we have to know that the police are going to protect and serve everyone. Yeah. And we can't do that if we've over-militarized the police. For sure. And we've criminalized all the aspects of community uh, coalition. And yeah. we've criminalized them. Yeah, yeah. It's a, and, and I... I appreciate you, uh, you you saying that because it really, really is. Uh, it's one of those things where there there has to be options. I have a lot of friends that are policemen, and I have so much respect for them and the job that they're trying to do and everything. But we can take funds and also bring in social workers, bring in people that know how to deal with mental health. There's all bring kinds in of longer things. and better and more thorough education for police officers. Exactly. What if exactly. we? I know this is an unpopular thing from a, for a black girl from South Central to say, but what if we actually gave police officers the right resources? Hey. What if we gave them, you know, you can be a police officer in as little as three months. What if we made it a year for yeah. training yeah. and you had to actually know de-escalation techniques? This would keep police officers safer. Why isn't that a thing that is met with just as much love? Yeah, no. Because I don't think that we need to make it so that police officers aren't safe either. I yeah. feel like... By saying, know your community, know who you're serving, sure. that's going to make you safer. I mean, yeah, exactly. It makes total sense. So stick around in the interview. We, we do get into that a lot more. As I, we, I learned a ton. It was really, really great. And before we go to the break, I, uh, I, I just kind of want to put this out. I, I, on the way over to rehearsal this morning, uh, I heard of a friend that just passed away. And I I'm had... So sorry. Yeah, no, and um, he'd been he'd been battling with cancer and I, uh, for a while, and I had a, an appointment, a standing appointment for him and I and um, and my girl to to get a photo shoot together and do all this, and it had just been one of those things where it was like it it, it didn't make it down low enough on the on the on the you know on the to do list, and and uh, that. Yeah, that's not going to be doable anymore. And so I do want to say, um, you know, in part of the gratitude and everything, I, make sure, you know, reach out to your loved ones. Make sure if there's somebody you haven't talked to in a while, your mom, your, your whomever, make sure to tell the people that you love them. And, uh, you know, this life is short. So take the opportunities that we get to, to love each other and to appreciate each other. And so... I will say that I echo that sentiment because I lost a friend recently and the week he died, he told me he loved me. Mm. And after he died, I really struggled with it. But I realized that he gave me just the most loving gift that the thing I get to remember about him is at the end of his life. He told me what um, I meant to him. And I think that that's a really powerful thing to be able to do for the people that you love. So it's not something that we should take lightly. Loving on one another should be a daily exercise, not something that we do by happenstance or for special occasion. Amen. Amen. All right. So when, we, uh, you know, take that to heart, love each other, love yourself. And uh, when we come back, our interview with uh, documentary filmmaker, Mr. Matthew Solomon. Joining us in the studio today, we are honored to have uh, Mr. Matthew Solomon, director of the documentary Reimagining Safety, which is uh, something that is definitely near and dear to my and, and I's for heart. Sure. And uh, so welcome to the show, Matthew. Thank yeah, you for coming on down. Thanks. Great, great to be here. Yeah, no, appreciate it. Appreciate it. And for the people that don't know, go ahead and uh, give, a, give us a little background on, on the, the movie and yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. It's yeah. a, I mean, the movie actually, I mean, really, it's, it's, it's kind of like where my, all the aspects of my life kind of intersected mm -hmm. so that's why i say i got to keep it short because it really is like i grew up here in la like you know blocks away from this studio uh i went to john burroughs junior high school fairfax high school which were very you know i'm i'm 50 so late se i was at john burroughs in the late 80s graduated at fairfax 91 so very integrated like all my friends were like every race every sure. uh, uh religion at fairfax it was one of the first schools to have a, a gay and lesbian uh, 
uh, I believe it was a club or a center mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and so, and I, <laughs> I was a I was a tap dancer, so I was I hey. you know grew up adjacent to West Hollywood, hey. was in you know the dance community, yeah. and so like my friends were always everybody, and so as a straight white male. Um, Jewish also, uh, I saw that my friends had different lived experiences than I did. And we talked about that. And we knew that if we went to, uh, the Beverly center, uh, they used to have an arcade at the top, you know, yeah. like my friends would get looked at differently or yep. they get, you know, followed around stores. And so that, that shaped how, you know, I, like in school we're taught, oh, we're all equal and, and mm. all of that. But then I would see it played out differently. And my friends were telling me different. So, you know, it, it started with that. Um, I went to music school out of high school. I went to USC. I was a studio jazz guitar major. Um, as you do. Yeah. <laughs> as I do. And while, so you're unemployed. Yeah, yeah well, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I actually, I, you know, I dropped out of school to go be a rock star. So, you know, hey, we, as we, you we, we all know as how, you that, how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I started taking sociology and anthropology classes while I was there. And I was always fascinated with societies, and how do we have societies that work and why do things not work? And we were learning about, uh, at the time they called it structural racism, not systemic, but structural racism at the same time as the Rodney King beating mm -hmm. and the LA riots. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing it played out as I'm learning about it. Um, so then fast forward, you know, like I said, keep it short. Um, you know, I was in the music business. I got into filmmaking. I started doing conflict resolution uh, because I was always fascinated with bringing people together and listening and, and getting people to hear other people's learned experiences and teaching people how to listen for that. Mm. Because when we do that, uh, the stuff that divides us kind of melts away and we can really connect. Yeah. Um, and so pre-pandemic, I was traveling, doing uh, doing conflict resolution for corporations and colleges. Uh, pandemic happens, can't go anywhere, sitting around, and I decided to go back to school. And so uh, I went into a master's in public administration program, figuring that I was done with the entertainment business, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get into government or politics or policy making where I could use my privilege and access um, to help support social movements. And I was applying all of the coursework to the issues with policing, incarceration, post-George Floyd, and, and all of that. And so when it came time to do my final thesis, uh, one of my academic advisors was like, we know you can write a paper, but we know that you used to make films. Why don't you do something creative and do a documentary? And I was like, that's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's a whole that's lot of work. You know? yeah. And she was like, well, you know, it could be like 10 minutes or something. And I'm like, I can't cover this in 10 minutes. No. And she was like, well, do it anyway. And I think I just needed that little push. Hmm. Yeah. Because um, I hadn't, I didn't script it before, but not documentary. And so yeah. I, I, took, I took my iPhone <laughs> and I interviewed 10 people, in including the district attorney of LA County and mental health professionals and activists and a uh, former LAPD officer. And Dr. Jody uh, Moore. Doctor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Yeah, because Jody. I remember you, the, with ties to the Watts Prophets and stuff like that, mm -hmm. it was really nice to see that perspective yeah. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in the film. Yeah, I wanted it to be, uh, I wanted a, a variety of viewpoints so people couldn't say, oh, it's just a bunch of activists, yeah. you know, or something like that. And mm -hmm. so I made this film as a student project, <laughs> turned it in and got an A. Uh, and then I showed it to some people, actually at Jody Armour's house, and they're like, this is really good. You need to like, you know, change this up, you know, make, on expand it. on it. I, I'm not a graphics guy, you know, sure. but, but stuff like that. And so I, I hired somebody to, to do all the graphics and tighten up the edit and, mm. and mix it. And we premiered in February, 2023, uh, at the San Pedro film festival it was a packed house and it just kind of taken off from there. We've but, been doing screenings all across the country, impact screenings, film festivals, and, and all of that. Well, the film's fantastic, and uh, one of the reasons we talked off camera, one of the reasons why um, I was so inspired to uh, to have you down and to talk to you, is because the sort of impetus for uh, slap in general, our, our our studio here and everything, kind of it came from a sort of helplessness that I felt in the pandemic, um, during the pandemic, like everybody, you know, the, the George Floyd situation was a tectonic shift in some ways, but as an artist, we immediately, as artists, we immediately went into, 
what we always do, which is, okay, let's, let's funnel this into our art. So we, we made music and videos about it and everything. And we were, you know, put it out and kind of this, we felt like this was our contribution back. And yet we caught so much shit for it. We were immediately, we were anti-police immediately. It was the, it was how the sort of quote unquote defund the police uh, thing got manipulated from a PR standpoint. And uh, I was like, okay, well, the next time this happens, and it will, it, it, it's going to happen again, we can't tweet our way out of it. And it, you know, you with a sing with your iPhone went out and have kind of, you know, you got up into a lot of stuff. And I was I was just really, really Im impressed by it. Because uh, I, I think we, we do need to figure out there's so much money in, in it from a union standpoint that's controlling it that, you know, usually we're pro-union here until mm -hmm. it gets to then the police unions, you know, because they're so over-militarized and everything. What is, what is your, from doing the film, what is the kind of biggest take that you've got that is, that is the biggest challenge that you think we're facing in trying to reimagine how we treat safety in our, in our communities? Uh, I mean, the the biggest thing is is really all the all the ways that we other people. Like we we as as people, we find ways to be like, oh, we're not like them, mm. or oh, they're the bad ones, we're the good ones, and that, you know, everybody's like, oh, we're the good ones. Um, that's the hardest thing I think to push through because even you know you're talking about unions, yeah. right? So we have you know the writer strike's been going on for a hundred plus days. Years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, you know, it's the hundred years war. Yeah. 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 So. You know, the actor strike and and you know online I see a lot of people being like, oh, they're just prima donnas. Oh, they get you know who get a real job, learn to you know hang drywall or whatever. Oh, right. You know, and so even the people that are supplying entertainment. Um, you know, I have a, <laughs> I have a cousin who's a, a very, very, very successful plumber who, you know, was, was trying to say that people in film, you know, have never worked a hard day's work in their life. And it's like, yeah, come hang out. Come on hang set, out on a 17 know, hour on a, day. On a 17 yeah. hour day in, you know, the hundred degree weather yeah. under a tent, yeah. you know, do, or underwater, or underwater for, for 12 hours. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. You know? yeah. yeah. So also too, I think that. One of the things I loved about your film was that it utilized the play on words of reimagining, redoing, et cetera, because I feel that once you put the label of defund the police mm. on the situation, you made upper middle class white people nervous. Mm -hmm. mm. So people didn't understand what was being added asked for when they were asking for the things through defunding the police and really what it seemed like what they were asking for was a reallocation yes. of funds yeah. and I feel like if they but you can't say reallocating the funds of the police it doesn't have the same, same commercial ring. glow yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so one of the things I would love to get into is the there is so much backlash against the defund the police mm -hmm. argument and there's so much backlash against the cities that have done so because they seem to uh, to the untrained eye present a poor example of what defunding the police can do. How do we change the attitudes of people to want to reallocate funding in a police department? Because I think it goes down to that same psychology of you saying about about people thinking that the actors and writers who are striking are prima donnas. Like, no, there's an issue, there's a crisis. And when you break it down and tell people, like, no, this is what you used to get and this is why it's not a living wage, it almost seems like you have to sit somebody down and disrupt their consciousness. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it comes up every time. You know, when we do uh, the community impact screenings, uh, there's always, always somebody who says, yeah, but can we call it something else besides defund, mm. right? Um, because it has been, like you were saying, polarized and, you know, like instantly. Instantly. It's um, like I can use this but as it a was tool. Instant, to, but yeah. it was almost like it was, you almost, it felt like the minute you said that word, you wanted it to be polarizing because mm -hmm. the minute you say something like that, especially against the, you know, thin blue wall and, right. you know, blue lives matter type situation, how could it not be? Mm -hmm. 
polarizing. Yeah, and it, it came out of protest movements, and it was part of the Black Panthers 10-point plan, which, you know, how, how I grew up learning about the Black Panthers was that, they, oh, they were this violent, you know, terrorist organization. And then I saw this documentary uh, on them, um, uh, you know, a few years back, and it was like, oh, no. They're they were community resistance. Community resistance. They fed the kids. They were, you know, keeping each other safe from police violence. Yeah. You know? The um, best parties of all yeah. the, pan- well, and, of all the people Panthers. People don't um, realize that the Crip organization came out. The, the yeah. Crips were community resistance um, uh, in progress. So they were look. that was what they were designed to do. I didn't even know. Um, yeah, know. That's the, that was yeah. the initial gang initiation of, of the Crips. They were an organization called uh, Community Resistance in Progress. So you would report um, any incidents of police violence, any incidents of violence against people in your community. That was what initially mm. the Crips were designed to do. Mm. And over time... Blue. Yeah, it became... Mm. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the, the, the it became what it became. Yeah. Yeah. But initially, many of these groups that have been demonized in the public eye started out as community resistance groups. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, oh I just just getting back to to your question about defund. One of the things that's been really um, that I'm really proud of with this film is that I have friends who are white liberal women, you know, white liberal men, but who who w- see the film and they're like, oh, I was afraid of defund the police. Now I understand what it is. And then they've gone and had conversations with their family members. So that's been great. I think. Um, you know, one, actually, there, w- there was somebody who worked in uh, politics at one of our screenings, I think in San Jose, you know, who was like, oh, Democrats lost all these elections because of defund. We need to change the title. And there were some black activists there who were like, no, we don't need to change the title. This is what it is. And, and it clicked for me that, you know, on the right... Um, their messaging is so like they just dig in and this is our message and this is what it is and yep. you know fuck you and you know this yep. is what and we need that on the left and not only do we need that but um, I don't think that enough of the people in leadership in on the politics side you know are educated enough as to what it because if I was holding office and that came up in a debate I would yes absolutely we mean defund the police fund the communities you know fund the people this people need resources the, the, the but, only the only pushback I would have on that is the defund from a mm-hmm. from a from a marketing perspective implies to most people take all the money away and, and really, so it's an it, easy sell on Fox exactly. News where they're like yeah. okay enjoy your fucking uh, you know enjoy the, when underfunded the, the, police yeah, new, not the police not showing up when you have your next problem and it's like ah, but no. what we're looking at is demilitarizing the police hey, when you're looking at that's a different yeah and that's a different that's a horse of a different color yeah. it also I think should be pointed out that police go through what three months of training mm-hmm. I just don't think that they're well versed enough to be police people like every other country you have to be you go through rigorous training and you learn um policing de-escalation mm-hmm. techniques that don't involve weaponry yeah mm-hmm. so it looks like and i also think that when you say the defund part when you look at what police people have a lot of times they don't have access to the right equipment. You know, they don't have access to um, up to date computerized equipment. Mm-hmm. So I've seen instances where people got sent to the wrong house just because the computers in the um, oh, vehicles yeah. didn't mm-hmm. work properly. Yeah. So that's when you start looking at, oh, defunding the police means that you're taking away these resources. And I'm like, no, if we maybe refunded. Yeah, re- actual resources and that fun. weren't military, you know, grade weaponry. Maybe we'd be getting. Yeah. Somewhere. Well, so Maryam Kaba uh, talks about police abolition, and what she says is, you know, we're we're not talking about cutting off all the resources tomorrow. Actually, it's said in the film by a couple of people. Yes, we're not talking about you know we're cutting it off tomorrow and you know good luck to everybody. You're all on your own. <laughs> See you later. We're talking. You know, Maryam Kaba talks about. Uh, coming to a place where police are obsolete. So Mm. by funding communities, by having housing, uh, education, jobs, food, you know, all the things that when you don't have them lead to crime, Mm. and this is, you know, shown statistically, um, when those things aren't, uh, when you have those things, when those needs are met, 
then crime goes down. Mm. And then you don't need as many police officers. You don't need the militarized uh, police, you know. So that's 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 one part. Um, in the film, Doctor L. Jones, who's mm-hmm. in Halifax, wrote a commissioned report that's two hundred pages on defunding the police, and they actually uh, termed it detasking. Mm. So taking tasks away, so not having police show up at mental health calls with or, so many well, tasks, yeah, 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 checks, yeah, things that they're not trained for, like you exactly. were saying. Exactly. Right. And the thing is. Um, you know, years ago, before I kind of ended up in, you know, the abolitionist space, uh, I participated uh, in role-playing activities. Tell me more. With the <laughs> with, with the LA, Ca- with the LA County Sheriff's Department. Oh, okay. And hey, so, but, hey, they they can party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was interesting, you know, because I was I, you know, they needed volunteers so that the 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 could uh, recruits, you know, could. Um, practice. Yeah. Right? And so the, the reality is on the average across the country, uh, police academies spend 60 hours on firearms training, shooting, and only eight hours of de-escalation. Mm. And so they're taught to command and control. Mm-hmm. The mindset that they're that drilled into them is when you walk into a space, you're the one in charge. People need to listen to you. You know, and if somebody pushes back, you you know, the way that they prove themselves is they have to fight or arrest somebody or right. write, you know, write tickets, make arrests. So it's all like none of that is about serving the community and de-escalating yeah. and taking care of people. Like the, there's a former police officer in the film. You know, I asked her, I said, you're not really taught how to how to talk to people. And she's like, no. Yeah. You it's, know, it's not their job to be. Uh, psychiatrists or I mean they're, they're, you're not trained to, in a lot of situations we have such a mental health issue mm-hmm. here like for example especially in Los Angeles that uh, you know I, I've around my house I actually have seen the police deal with um, you know m- the mental mm-hmm. health issues of some of the homeless in a way that is actually it's been impressive I don't know if, if you know how LA fares in that or whatever but I can't imagine from the police that I have talked to and the police that are friends of mine and everything, they don't, a lot of times they don't, that's not what they, they don't want to be in charge of that. They'd rather somebody that is, you know, higher, more, more qualified, more qualified yeah. to yeah. do that kind of stuff. Cause that must be scary. Exactly. Like you would, yeah, it's just frightening. And, and we don't, I, I mean, to their credit, I don't think that we give enough empathy to police officers in those situations, especially because they don't have the training sure. nine times out of 10 mm-hmm. to deal with it. That must be very, very frightening. So it's one of those things where sometimes I feel like the defund the police aspect of it, you get blowback because it makes, by, by saying we want police obsolescence, you're also saying that you want to take away a uh, certain their jobs, your yeah, safety, and, and, a, and, and a certain um, cemented uh, life that comes from having that kind of a government job. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So they make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. but they make a lot of money eventually. Like when mm-hmm. they come out of the academy, they don't make a lot of money. And I think part of the problem is a lot of these people are being transferred to areas that they don't know anything about, yeah. that they can't afford to live in, mm-hmm. and so they don't know anything about these communities, and then they're being asked to protect and serve these communities that they know nothing about. So I think that you're getting more um, instances of violence due to lack of awareness and just pure ignorance that institutes fear. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like in some way we have to find a bridge of instilling community values back into the police department because I was talking to a friend of mine uh, whose dad was a policeman Mm -hmm. and he said you know back in the day he said I was a policeman in the 80s and 90s and I retired in like right around early 2000 but I served this part of South Central and this part of Venice and I knew all the gang Mm -hmm. leaders I knew all Mm -hmm. the community activists Mm -hmm. I knew all the drug dealers I knew who to talk to when things got spicy and I could you know make change but now I don't feel like you have that with your police and they're almost encouraged not to do that Mm -hmm. so what do we feel like I know that there's so many perspectives in the film that show that part of this issue comes from an underlying psychological instillment of Mm anti-blackness so can you talk a little bit about that and what that underlying factor means and why it's hard to combat 
Yeah, I mean that that's yeah, it was it was a uh, question. Unconscious bias, yeah, right? Unconscious was bias. What, you yeah. can't, can't train your uh, D- Dr. Jody Armour. Yeah, you can't yep. train your way out of unconscious anti-black bias. It's woven in, and as a filmmaker, you know, looking back at like the movies and TV I was raised with and how black people are often often portrayed like the, the movie Hollywood Shuffle you know it's like oh I'm either a slave or a drug dealer mm, or, a or a pimp or a pimp yeah. you know and so shout out to pimps yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> you killed in my only <laughs> <his> brother <laughs> um, we're we're socialized uh, you know we you know most of us but as a, as a as a as a white male like we're socialized to see black people as dangerous you know I remember being in second grade and you know, I, the elementary school I went to was 75% black and most of those kids were bussed in, you know, from South Central around mm. there. And so it was always like, oh, they're, they get into fights more because it's a rougher neighborhood. Mm. You know, there was no awareness or conversation about, no, it's an under, it's a community underserved. that's underserved. Mm-hmm. They don't have resources. They got to sit on a bus for however long, wake up early, you know, be here in this environment, go back there. Um, you know, who knows what's up, you know, with the parents, like my dad taught, uh, elementary school in, in South Central also for a number of years. So, you know, we have, we have this, um, socialized way that we, we look at like, who are the others? Um, what are the dangerous communities? You know, what are this and that? And then we just, and it's easy to write it, write, write them off. Mm-hmm. Right. So how do we combat that? I mean, I think, I think with, um, you know, post George Floyd, but I think even before that, uh, there was a lot more, um, interest in anti-racism, Yes, you know, and people reading books and book clubs and then taking courses. I know like I, I started taking courses around 2017, 18 that were specifically on anti-racism and decolonizing. And, uh, one of my teachers, uh, Reverend Bridge Feltis has a course called heal thyself for people racialized as white, you know, where we go through, like, these are all the ways that we've been socialized, um, to lack empathy for black people to, you know, see black people as the others. This is how it's affected black people, like the generational trauma through um, uh, slavery and reconstruction and Jim Crow, like all of that. And so, uh, you know, it's it's education. It's amp- the right kind of the education. right kind of yeah. yeah, the right kind of education. Uh, teaching people how to be empathetic, I think that's a big missing. I think that's also part of what's caused us to, you know, like. You know, if if cops back in the day were more like involved in the community, there was probably a sense of empathy there to some extent. That's not there. Like I, you know, I'll ask a cop. You know, I I have asked in the past at cops for directions. I don't really talk to them anymore. Um, <laughs> but you know, you just get this like stone flat, face, stone yeah. face, like. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh, how do I get to the? Oh, you go down there and you go down there and you. Da, da, da. Yeah. You I actually it? had. Okay, so I've, I grew up, I was born in uh, Long Beach. I grew up in Wasson, South Central. And then when I was uh, 11, we moved to Hancock Park. But I grew mm. up seeing, you know, slews of gang members with ties on their hands. Or, or not even gang members, just um, black men because they had on raider caps, mm-hmm. like being just zip tied. Yeah. Like, and I grew up with this. So I grew up, um, I remember uh, they shot my neighbor um, because they had the wrong address. Mm-hmm. Uh, Johnny Cochran actually repre- re- represented oh, wow. uh, the family because they shot him like 47 times. Um, I remember when my great uncle and great aunt were alive, there was some kind of shooting that happened two blocks away and they arrested every black man within a five block radius and at the time my great uncle was in his like late 70s so I grew up with this image of being completely petrified by policemen and a couple weeks ago I was in downtown and there's one stretch of downtown near first street where all of the federal buildings are Mm -hmm. where those meters are like nine dollars an hour or something like ridiculous and they don't take cards so i'm sitting there i had to run in some paperwork um to one of the federal buildings i'm like great i've like i literally put in five dollars worth of quarters and that gave me 10 minutes and i'm just like it's gonna take me that long whatever and this man taps me behind my shoulder and it was a cop and i was terrified immediately like Uh i was immediately like i was like i didn't do anything wrong i did it he was like ma'am these meters are the worst and he literally took out quarters Mm. from his own pocket and started putting them in the meter and he was like that should give you like 25 minutes you need more Mm. than 
than that. Just let me know. Amazing. And I was like, I and I had to stop him and say, listen, I am from here and I have grown up with a bias and fear yeah. of policemen my yeah. whole life. Yeah. And the fact that this just happened and that you were nice, like you are like single handedly trying to be out here changing folks' minds. Yeah, yeah. But before, but like the immediate terror that sure. I felt by this man tapping me on the shoulder because that hasn't been the case with so many police encounters yeah. that I personally have had. Yeah. And I know that there are good cops out there and they must be frustrated. I wonder what we tell cops that don't want to have that stigma attached to mm -hmm. them to do. Well, I think, I think like in the, in the same way that um, white people have a lot of responsibility in dismantling racism, uh, the whoever the good cops are have a responsibility in really understanding the impact of the culture of policing. That's a great point. And yeah. and what policing represents. And and you know you, you were, we were talking about um, uh, you know funding and that sort of thing. Like the the reality is nobody's been defunded. The you know the. Uh, they have more money. Than, yeah, yeah, they've been over militarized. I mean, over, they're they're over, over militarized yeah. and, consistently. And it, you know, Gina Viola says this in the film: the budget for LAPD has grown fifty percent in yeah. the last ten years. And between LAPD and the sheriff's department, we're spending over seven billion dollars yep. a year. Now, so, is that is that the is that, sorry to cut you off, but mm -hmm. is that is that the unions now just have so they they know this is. Because I, I remember seeing some documentaries where they're like, you know, you have a quota for the DEA, which is mm -hmm. why it's this ridiculous war, right? It's like the, and it, it's, what's your finding from the film that it, that the sort of kink in the wheel is is the union, the allocation of those funds? Uh, we didn't really get into the the union part of it, you know. I know that um, the unions are lobbying, you know, for more money and for more protections and all of that, whereas you know everybody else want more transparency and want resources to communities and and that and that sort of thing and so um that wasn't really discussed in the film although i've had discussions you know outside the film mm -hmm. that's uh, it also seems like it'd be a, its own film yeah yeah <laughs> yeah 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 because there's a there's a an aspect when you actually realize that okay, uh, we did uh, uh, something during the pandemic where we went to South Carolina. We shot this, well, it was on this uh, the uh, site of the Cane Hoy riot, which was the largest race riot uh, in Reconstruction. And uh, you, you start to see almost the genesis post the Emancipation Proclamation of, okay, well, we'll just move this form of slavery. I think this is Ava DuVernay's point in her documentary and everything, but we'll just move this form of slavery into incarceration of the black male and sort of destructuring the black family unit, which, you know, in a way that that's this, that's this giant systemic problem. But as we've kind of gone on now to, to your point earlier, if it's not, if they're not finding, you know, getting in the community with people that live in the community and, and get to know people and can kind of solve these problems and everything. How do, how, what was your finding or what do you, think is the, the sort of way to get at uh, if you have um, almost a baked in sort of thing uh, the system is baked in and once you once you're incarcerated black male it's almost impossible to get out and you talk about that in the film that yeah. um, you talk about how there were de-incarceration programs that were effective super effective and working very very well it almost seems like the minute uh, prisons became privatized mm -hmm. that went away mm -hmm. so is that the cause or what is the cause behind those programs being destroyed. I mean, you know, if we're going to be real and accurate, the cause is money, economics. Um, the cause is capitalism. Mm. Uh, there's a financial incentive to locking people up yep. and keeping people locked up because, you know, either the private prisons are making money or, the, you know, the, Ava DuVernay talks about this in 13th. Yeah. You know, all the, the fr almost free, practically free labor. You yeah, know? Right. So it's like the new the new uh, institution of slavery is is prisons. Is the call. You know, um, uh, yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, when Donald Glover uh, hosted Saturday Night Live, he did this great skit about that where he showed all of these. They're like killers and gangbangers, but they're all working for uh, in prison at a call center. 
her. So they're like, yeah, I murdered three people. Hello, welcome to Victoria's <laughs> Secret. How can I process your order? But that's really true. Yeah. Yeah. Almost all the yeah. call centers for almost every major mm. retail brand that's crazy. go through yeah. process. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I loved the point about how it's it's kind of easy when we when you look at it on a dollars and cents standpoint. It's $300 a day, I think they said in the film, mm. to, to incarcerate someone. And it's $125 yeah. a day to actually have a full housing rehab and, and give yeah. somebody a, a, a hand up for a job or Make a way more to, functional member yeah of and yeah. it's like why would we not do that mm-hmm. and, and is it just when you say money is it just that it's what's what's the way out of that do we just have to is it legislative and legislative only or i think i think it's a collective where enough people have to say no more yeah we're not going to put up with this anymore you know and you know you were talking about um you know the good cops or the cops that do good things you know at at times and and one of the one of the issues is that as alex vitale says in the film police are violence workers at the core of their like their base job is to handle people Mm. and you know whether it's you know, it, it, and, violently, and, and, and or violently, violently or not violently, <laughs> yeah. but, but if you don't comply, it becomes violent, you know? So there, there might be individuals who are doing good things and trying to change things. And the police as a whole, uh, the institution of policing, the culture of policing has a very negative impact, especially on uh, black and brown communities. Mm-hmm. So with that, with with the knowledge that there are people who are getting rich off of the way things are and they're not going to give up their money or power, um, I, I think enough of the, the working class – you know, has to be like, yeah, no, no more. We're not doing this anymore. And, uh, yeah, it seems like you have to shame the, the the more you publicly shame those kinds of people into not wanting to do that be- kind of behavior, then the behavior doesn't become profitable anymore, and they switch to something else. But yeah. it's it's getting that initial push to happen, and that just seems like it's its own quagmire. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to the whole like messaging thing, like. You know, it's like whatever message that gets put out, there's going to be a swift, like, like even the whole CRT thing. Like I was literally reading yeah. Kimberly Crenshaw's, you know, paper on intersectionality thinking, wow, this is amazing. I yeah. love this. Everybody should read it. And then two days later, they're like, CRT is teaching our kindergartners yeah. to hate hate themselves for being white. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. no, if you're, if no. You're in, no, if you're in it Florida. Is. But it's like, yeah. not, but I, I also feel like that happens because these people don't read these papers they make mm-hmm. this assumption about this yeah and yeah. then there it's very easy to make an assumption about something you know nothing about you know yeah. well like so the the cousin of mine who's the successful plumber um he grew up in the valley and at one point you know recently like within the last five or six years you know he was he was ranting about affirmative action he's like because of that i couldn't be in the fire department because they had a quota mm. or something. And I'm like, yeah, but you have this like major plumbing business because you didn't become a firefighter. Yeah. You know, and so there's there's always this um p- the affirmative action thing is tough for me because I know for college everybody assumed that I got into college because mm. of affirmative action mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, affirmative action mostly helps white women. Mm-hmm. And it w- and they were the biggest proponents against it. Yeah. But the single largest group that is helped by affirmative action in university, in workforce, period, yeah. is white women. So the fact that this always gets turned around mm-hmm. on black and brown well, people bias, yeah. is very infuriating because it couldn't be further from mm-hmm. the truth. And it's easily verified that's mm-hmm. a part yeah sure I'm like, there's data you came up with this bias because somebody said these black people got into college because of affirmative action that is not the case and the fact that anybody can use that and have it come out of their mouth as an excuse for why they didn't get something yeah. is mm-hmm. crazy to me yeah. yeah do you have a sense of uh you know hope or do you have a sense of sort of feeling like you know because I, I know uh, we just shift from one industrial complex to another the pharmaceutical industrial yeah. complex, you know the military and then now it's the incarceration uh, c- complex and do you have a sense of sort of hope on where any kind wh- where a movement is 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 going or possible in a reimagining safety in a post-george floyd world 
I, I, I do now. I didn't like a year ago <laughs> when I was working on the documentary. Um, actually, uh, Chelsea Byers, who's a uh, West Hollywood City Council person, she she was just elected. Uh, about a year ago, we were having lunch, and she's like, she asked me, she's like, "Do you have hope?" Mm. And and I had to think about it, mm-hmm. you know, because usually, like up until 2020, um, even with everything going on, like I was, I I had a lot of faith in humanity and in people, and then seeing the you know how people reacted to COVID, and you know not believing in sure. all of that and then George Floyd and then January 6th January 6th all of it yeah. it was like Oof. like wow we're we're actually not doing well yeah, yeah. You know? yeah it could just seem like for a minute humanity just went from tripping to a full vacation yeah. for like yeah. four who, years who was in charge in the White House at that most of the time yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but even but before it, even, that even before like, that it's mm-hmm. it's still it just it seemed like the 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 floodgates of sort of the oh, I don't have to be closeted about my racism anymore. As a matter of fact, I can run strongly on mm-hmm. it and, and mm-hmm. you know, win, a, win the Republican primary. And I suppose that is, uh, you know, that's part of the systemic issue. That's part of the empathy issue. That's part of the education part, right? It, mm-hmm. But, but um, is, is the hope with the money that's out there that's already out there for a very militarized police force and i i i am i love i've got a lot of friends that are policemen i am very i am i'm pro police i'm just trying to figure out like what what is the bottleneck in the systemic breakdown on how there's all this money like you said the la la um uh, union police unions asking for more money what you know did they need more money for more bodies because they, they with seven billion dollars you should be able to do some stuff yeah right? i mean it's more money just for more money because yeah. somebody's getting somebody's, Cause getting, somebody's getting it it's yeah. probably not even being allocated yeah. to your foot soldiers it's going well, to superintendents and yeah you know and, and commissioners a lot, a and lot of cops are, are i mean they're making six figures they're making 200 you know, thousand dollars a year and up plus pension and mm-hmm. all of that. Like a lot of people don't don't realize that. Um, but getting back, to, you know, to your hope question, I do have hope. And and the thing that that's been helpful for me is traveling around the country. And when we do these community screenings, and we have, you know, we do panels with local leaders, mm. and there's a community and people are involved. Like they're they get inspired, and mm-hmm. um, a lot of times there's like a. Uh, several different organizations will come together to host a screening and Mm. then they're building stronger coalitions with each other. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a long haul and they even say this in the film, it's, you know, it's not going to happen in our lifetime and there people are coming together and I see uh, people's mindsets, you know, changing, you know, in positive ways. Um, I think, you know, also you, you know, talking about Trump and everything, it, it became, uh, uh, you know, economically uh, fortuitous to be mean, like oh, wow, like yeah, being right. mean, like and that and I think that started with you know with Twitter also, but sure. but like like all the reality TV shows that you know we had the yeah, uh, Jerry yeah. Springers and, and the Simon Cows and, and, and the Simon, la, la, la. all of that. And yeah. It's like yeah, you know, and, and so like it, it it's become uh, you know a way to you know move up the social ladder is by sure. being mean and so we have to i think combat that and normalize also. being kind yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I love the way the film kind of closed with um it's it's not radical to defund the police it's radical that that they have tanks you know and that they've got all and this tasers w- ta- and this blah, weaponry blah. from uh, the from, you know, war. from wars yeah. and you know it's radical that we keep putting this much money into uh, an uh, a, a sort of an aggressive police cuz you basically made them arms dealers <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know but i do i do i i liked that because it made me think differently already i was like actually yeah that's not radical you know what what's radical would be to to you know that that's that's radical having given them all this this heavy artillery and given them you know the the license to, to, and yeah batarams and stuff like that and so i mean it's something like uh, i forget the exact number it's around like 1100 people were murdered by the police last year you know that's and that's with the budgets increasing three a day yeah, yeah that's, that's crazy. crazy that's crazy yeah. well so how do we get more eyes to your film yeah. because it seems like the takeaway I have is that dialogue mm-hmm. mm. and c- specifically dialogue within different communities gets that ball rolling. Mm-hmm. And it seems like your film does a wonderful job. I, I 
having seen it, think that your film does a wonderful job of evoking some of these questions in a way that makes a person not just think, but think critically. Mm. So how do we get more eyes to see to see this? Yeah, well, thank, thank you for that. Uh, so we're, we're actually... We we're talking to some distributors. Okay. So I'm hoping that in the next few months it will be released uh, on platforms. Um, in the meantime, uh, reimaginingsafetymovie.com is the website, and Reimagining Safety Movie is our Instagram account. And you can go there. Uh, there's trailers. There's information about the film. Uh, we have a we have like seven screenings coming up so far september october so, okay and we can list our those yeah. screenings in our yeah. show notes so, and, for, and all for over like we're in you know uh goddard college in vermont we're in seattle and tacoma washington hosted by the black panther party yeah. washington state up there um so all over a and if you're listening and you want to host a community screening in your community you can reach me through the website and there's a my email there and we'll, we'll set something up that's and, awesome. and that's what we've been doing you know a, over a thousand people have seen the film since february and over 40 different organizations have worked together to host those screenings you know and there's demand for more and people are always like where can i see it again or where can you know i tell my friends to go see it and so that that's been really it's amazing. a it's real i love i love how you know, it's it's real and to the point, and yet, um, you know, it feels like it's it's much needed. So the film is called Reimagining Safety in a Post George Floyd World. Matthew, thank you so much for coming on down and talking with us. Yeah, Please keep us posted on everything that's going on with it, and let us know how we can help in the future. Too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, also, right. I love that your zigzag made community change. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty dope. Oh, yeah, through yeah. Uh, like my life. Zigzag? Yeah. Yeah. No. Right. That's dope. Well, yeah. Because because I I always say like if if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. But if you kind of take a step back, it's like oh I can I can see how that, how that wound up. Uh, there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's really and, dope. And none of it was planned except that I wanted to be a rock star out of high school, and you know, and I was in music. But then like film wasn't planned, conflict resolution wasn't planned, making this certainly wasn't planned. Like I thought I was done with film, like I said. So, well, you were smart yeah. to stay out of music. Yeah. <laughs> I love music. It's ruined my life. It's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot. I break up with music like every other day. Every other day. Every other day. It's like my weird, abusive boyfriend. Right, mm -hmm. right. I just can't. I can't quit you. I can't quit you. Can't it's quit my you. broke back mountain. Hey, yeah. hey. Well, thank you again, Matthew. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, before, Wasn't that good? Mm, it's amazing. I mean, uh, I mean, I learned so much. And I, you know, the film, I just love a film like that that uh, is not afraid. Plus, Matthew was so even keeled and articulate about subjects in a way that I think is really powerful because it just comes off as diplomatic almost. Yes, yes. No, amen. And so make sure to check our show notes. We'll have all the information on how to get a hold of uh, checking out the movie and anything like that. And if you are a distributor, by the way, hit up, uh, hit us up at uh, holla. holla info at uh, slapmusicmedia.com. We'll try and help the guy out with a distribution deal. But before we go, we're going to do uh, part of this new segment we're calling Tour, Tour Stories. Stories. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Maya, what do you got today for your for your tour story? This, These horror this, tour stories. This tour horror story is brought to you by a rock band that I cannot name because if you saw our previous episode, you will know that your girl performs for multiple people. <laughs> In which she has to sign hefty NDAs That's to keep right. her job. So uh, this rock band was no different. And it was when I first started backup singing, and I was very excited to get the gig. Uh, we were playing at a huge stadium, and the lead singer is also an actor. Make of that what you will. And he sometimes thinks that he's Jesus. Make of that what you will. So at this very large that's, venue. That's limiting it. I'm trying to guess. I know. I know the people you've been out with. I'm trying to think. But go, keep, go ahead. So. so he comes out in a fur coat, no shirt, pants, boots, and a cowboy hat. Hey. And he tells the audience, do you love me? And of course they say yes. And he says, do you love me? And I love of course this he says yes. Now, he is on a platform because we are in a stadium and sure. there is a cage and there's 20 bodyguards that are very, very burly. Yeah, yeah. Right. And he says, if you love me, bless me with your spit. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So this entire 
stadium of people spit on 20, I would say black guys. I'm just going to go on. You know what? And I don't remember there being a white guy there. They spit on 20 black guys that look like the size of Escalades in security officer jackets. And then a riot ensued. Oh and God. then we had to leave. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely a tour story. I had to flee for my life. Thank Holy you. Holy shit. Wow. Wow. Bless yeah. me. Bless you. Bless you. Your spit. Bless me with your spit. That, that's that's all right. I I mine this tour story for this show is actually uh, a funny one and uh, it is funny because it is. Uh, I used to. I used to say all the time. I've got no limit soldier uh, tattooed on the bottom of my feet, too. <laughs> because when you're in this game, you just don't know. Uh, you don't know how to quit. Like we don't. We 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 don't know when to stop. We we just we work. We're workaholics. We every day. Any day that ends in a Y is a work day. Um, we were our manager. Shout out to Doc McGee, um, dear 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 friend and our, and our former manager one of the greatest managers of all time we were staying at, in nashville and we had our first show was in memphis and so we at the time we didn't have a tour bus or anything this this was uh this was vintage trouble so it's i'll, I'll, I'll say that because it's even more funny um so we were in a sprinter van and we got maybe we were so excited. We we're like, we're on our way to Memphis. It's going to be fucking great. Uh, we got a gig this night. It's going to be really, really cool. We were uh, schlepping our own gear and everything. And we're in the Sprinter and we leave town. We get about 10 minutes outside of town and the fucking, the, the Sprinter breaks down. Of so, course it does. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, okay. And it's hot as fuck. And we're like, okay. So finally we wait. We get a, we get a tow truck. And the way, I forget how it got broken up, but I want to say, Ty and I rode in the tow truck and then we had somebody else who was who had gotten a car who, who was going to drive in a car and, and put everybody else in that. And so the tow truck drives us to Memphis because we have to make the gig on time, right? No matter what happens, the, the van Get can break down. The gig you got it. You know, the show must go on. It does not stop. And so we get, you know, it was like, man, where are we going to make it? And we're hustling, we're hustling. And it's, you know, I'm in a tow truck. We pull up to the gig in a tow truck and it is a dive bar. It is a crazy <laughs> dive bar. The, just the smallest dive bar. We get out and it's about time for us to play and no one, and I mean no one, is there. Yeah. Zero. And so we play the gig and all of a sudden there's these two people that come in and we're like, we got, we've got two people that are, uh, you know, they're watching the show and this is great, but they have this giant wolf with them not a wolf a wolf a real wolf that so it's two people a giant wolf and vintage trouble in Good this Lord. gig playing the wolf comes up on stage sits down and just chills and as a wolf will as do. a wolf will do and so you know we we finish our set and it's all done come to find out we were opening up for those two people no you were not we you were, were opening up for the for wolf, wolf people yeah we were opening up to, so these two people i think i want to say it was either a boyfriend girlfriend or a brother sister band and then they had a wolf that was part of the stage accoutrement because the 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 wolf was was part of the back line the wolf just sat up on stage and we were like are you going to give them like ear earphones or something like that you know but no the wolf was just in, you know into it's it sitting chilling. there listening, listening so tow truck ride to a gig and a wolf on stage you know you can that time uh, you opened for a wolf that time we opened for a wolf and a tour Not story wolf. no 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 so thank you guys as always for listening make sure to reach out uh, if you have any questions any kind of shows you want to hear about uh, you know we always always look forward to your comments and we will see you next week slap the power bye Slap the Power is written and produced by Rick Barrio Dill and Maya Sykes. Associate producer, Bree Corey. Audio and visual engineering and studio facilities provided by Slap Studios LA with distribution through our collective home for social progress in art, Slap the Network. If you have any ideas for a show you want to hear or see, or if you would like to be a guest artist on our show, please email us at info at slapthepower.com. Yo!